Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Spirit, so that as the Scriptures are read and your Word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. For we ask it in your Son's name. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. I'm told that there was a father of five children who won a raffle, and when he turned in the ticket, he was given a small toy. Well, you can imagine his dilemma. One toy, five children. So he began asking the children, who is the most obedient? No one raised their hand. Who listens to mommy and does what mommy says? No one raised their hand. Who doesn't back talk mommy? No one raised her hand. And finally, the smallest one of the five raised his hand and said, Okay, Daddy, you can have the toy. <laughs> and then there was a teacher who was talking in her class about authority, and she asked the class, uh, Who is it in your house that's the boss? And a little girl raised her hand, and she says, My daddy says that he wears the pants in our family but we all know my mommy tells him what, which ones to put on. <laughs> and then there was a company that held a contest for children uh, with a theme, the nicest thing my father ever did for me, and one child answered, he married my mother. And of course, uh, we can't get by without the little Johnny story. Um, a child was asked what, difference was, what the difference was between Mother's Day and Father's Day, and little Johnny said, well, the gift doesn't cost us much, and Dad doesn't make us go to church. <laughs> now, when I first read this text this morning, I, I didn't think it had much to do at all with Father's Day. And, and the lectionary uh, just didn't play in the civil holidays at all. Their main concern in designing the lectionary that we attempt to cover the entire Bible over a three-year period. And um, as I did my word study and my historical studies this week and with the text, it just didn't ring true for Father's Day. Uh, until I started thinking about it a little bit more and praying about it a little bit more, um, Jesus is doing a lot with these disciples that mimics or mirrors what good fatherhood, I think, is. From the day he called them uh, from the common task of their daily lives and set them on a journey into ministry and mission for the kingdom of God, he began nurturing them and teaching them uh, in a way that is going to create more disciples and transform the world for God. So he talked to them. He talked to them. He talked to them not just about spiritual things. He talked about re relational things. He talked about material things. He talked about uh, people. He talked about authority. He talked about a lot of things other than just spiritual. But in the talking, he was preparing them for ministry and mission. Now, words have a tremendous power. They have power to change life for better or for worse. Think for the moment all the words that have framed your life through the years. They have. You don't think so? Think about these words. Yes. No. You passed. You failed. You're guilty. You're not guilty. Will you marry me? Are you kidding? <laughs> Words have power to change everything. Remember, creation itself came into being by a word from God. And Jesus creates 
the church mission with words. Now, we all grew up with that little ditty, that little child rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will. Yeah, right. It's a nice little story, isn't it? It's a nice little ditty, but it's not true. Words can hurt. Words can split the soul wide open. Words can change everything. They can have a dramatic effect on what we know, how we perceive reality, how we view ourselves, how we view others, how we interpret our own past, how we're going to look into the future. Words can influence us, inspire us, or just as easily bring us to our knees and drench us in our own tears. Yes, words have tremendous power. You remember the words of President Roosevelt? All we have to fear is fear itself. Words spoken to a nation that was gripped, not only in economic depression, but in emotional depression. And think of the words of Sir Winston Churchill during the, the, the Battle of Britain when he went on the radio and he said, we're going to fight in the streets, we're going to fight on the land, we're going to fight on the beaches, we're going to fight on the land and in the air. We will never surrender. And it encouraged that nation in the midst of all that destruction and darkness to gather itself up and fight off the power that was coming toward its shores. Think about Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg. Four score and seven years ago, our father brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Driving us back to the original document that formed us into a nation and reminding us that we still had steps to go. Yeah, words can change our relationships, our demeanors, our entire system of belief. They can change what we think of others. Yes, and again, they can change what we even think of ourselves. Words are powerful. And I think the most powerful words ever written and ever spoken were these. For God so loved the world. And those Easter words, He is risen. He is risen. God used words in pulling creation out of chaos. And in Jesus, in these words, is taking all the emotional baggage of these disciples and getting them directed towards a purpose and towards a cause. Words reminding the disciples that God had given him authority to transform the world, and now he is giving that authority over to these disciples. Yeah. Words are powerful, and it's my guess that every one of you can remember something someone said to you that changed your life. I remember a church member many years ago uh, in Seneca. Very successful. And I asked him one day the, the source of his success. And he, he had this... Um, distant look on his face, and then he came back to the question. He said, it was my father. And I said, well, tell me about that. He said, it was easy. He told me one day I wasn't going to mount to anything. And I spent the rest of my life to prove him wrong. So even negative words, sometimes, sometimes, can become positive in life. 
She was born Marguerite Johnson in St. Louis and raised in Stamps, Arkansas and in, in, and in San Francisco. By the age of nine, she began writing poetry, mainly to escape the physical and sexual abuse she was enduring. She was a single mother by 17, became the first black streetcar conductor in San Francisco, and uh, by the time she was in her early 20s, she had already earned a Tony Award on Broadway for a performance, a singing performance, and she starred in the miniseries Roots with um, uh, um, James Earl Jones. Uh, she worked with Dr. Martin Luther King. She wrote the book, Why the Cage Bird Sings. Do you know why the cage bird sings? Because it has a song to sing. It has a song to sing. Well, she died a few weeks ago. You see, she became Marie Angelou. And a national treasure in poetry and in life. And why did she change? How did she change? What took her from that nine-year-old being physically and sexually abused to this stalwart in, in, in faith and character? She said it was her mother. And in her early 30s, her mother told her, now she says, prefaces, she says her mother was a sorry mother for children. But she was a great mother for youth. Her mother one day took her by the face, cupped her face in her hands, looked into her eyes and said, you are the most wonderful person I have ever met. And Marie said, well, I had to think about that for a second. And if I'm going to be the most wonderful person my mother ever met, I've got to change some things. I better change some things in my life. And she started the track. We know these words before us this morning as the Great Commission. And what struck me about these words uh, that we often don't see is they are very emotional. They're emotional. They're just, they're just not on the page there. When, when you look at them, you realize there's something deeper going on rather than just words. There's something emotional taking place. Jesus, Jesus is departing. He's separating himself from these disciples and the disciples are actually separating from him as well. Now, in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense, they're going to be meshed for eternity. But in a physical sense, Jesus is leaving them. And they have to be prepared for what they're called to do. It reminds us that the church was never designed you see, the disciples are the beginnings of the church. Last week, we, we learned about the Spirit coming upon the disciples and, and creating the church. Well, in this text, we have the purpose of the church. And um, it reminds us that the church was never designed to serve itself. It's not a country club. The church is not a civic or civil organization. Everything the church does should have one goal and one goal in mind only, and that is creating disciples for Jesus Christ and the transformation of the world. That's it. We're not here to serve ourselves. We're here to serve others. Let's think of this for just a second. If there was a ship in a harbor, it's been built and it, it never leaves the harbor. The people just run out and paint it and put new fuel in it, and when the fuel runs out, they put more fuel in it, and when it gets rusty, they paint it again. But it never goes out. Or an airplane sitting at an airport, and it's idling there, and when the fuel tanks get low, someone runs out and fills the tank up, and they wash the windshields, and it just continues to idle and sit there. What good are they? Nothing. Because they're not designed to do that. They're not designed to sit in a harbor. They're not designed to sit at the airport. They're designed to serve others. They're designed to leave the harbor, take people, to transport people, 
That was their intent. There's a German story about a German soldier who was wounded during World War II, and he was ordered to the military hospital. And uh, when he gets there, he sees a sign, slightly wounded, critically wounded. Well, he goes through the door, it says slightly wounded. And he goes down a long corridor, and at the end of the corridor, there's two more signs. It says for officers and for non-officers. He goes through the non-officer door. And down another corridor he heads, where he sees two more doors for party members, for non-party members. He goes through the door, non-party members, and when he opens the door, he's outside. <laughs> His mother asked him, tell me about the hospitals. And he said, to tell you the truth, the people there didn't do that much for me. The entire experience left me as I just like, like I had just arrived. Uh, I was ill when I got there, and I was ill when I left, but you should see the tremendous organization they got. <laughs> you know, some ways I think people out there look at us that way. They see us as a, as a tremendous organization, but doing little to transform their lives. Jesus is sending these disciples into the world to be servants. Not to be served. He's sending them out to do ministry. He's sending them out to do mission. He's sending them out to create more disciples. He's creating disciples not for their own sake, but disciples to transform the world. Now, the last 20, 30 years, the world has transformed the church. But we're called to transform the world. Several years ago, there was a, uh, a movie that came out, The Mission. You, you remember that, The Mission? It was a good movie. And there was a character in it by the name of Mendoza. He was a brutal man, an angry man. And in a fit of rage, he kills his brother. Now, he very rarely had any remorse for anything he did, but in, that really tore his soul asunder. And he felt very guilty about it, about killing his brother. And a priest came along and um, offered him forgiveness and invited Mendoza to go with him on a journey into the jungle. And Mendoza takes his uh, shield and his sword and all of his implements of, of battle and puts them in a sack and ties a knot around it and then puts it on his back. And he carries that heavy bundle into the jungle and up the hill, symbolic of his guilt. And when he gets to the top, there are natives there, and one recognizes him for being a slave trader. And the native runs over with a knife in his hand and puts it up the Mendoza's throat and is ready to kill him right on the spot. And he sees Mendoza just relax and is waiting for death. And the native realizes this, there's something has changed about this man that he's not angry any longer. So, the Indian takes, the native takes his knife and cuts the pack off, his, off Mendoza's back and tosses it off the hill down the waterfall, symbolic of forgiveness, of mercy and charity. This native, this native has created a disciple for Jesus Christ by taking that burden off his back and tossing it away. And in Mendoza, ends up going into the priesthood to transform the world. We may not have a violent past from which we have to be freed, but we've got brokenness. We've got issues in, in our past. We've got darkness in our character, in our personality. We may have anger, animosity, and guilt past, uh, of the past that robs us of any joy or hope or celebration in the present or in the future. And that has to be cut away and tossed to the side for us to become the disciples that Jesus has called us to become. Jesus has given us a mission, a commission. Now, a commission means what? It's not just a mission. A co-mission means you're doing it with somebody else, right? Who are we doing it with? Absolutely. Yeah, the co-mission is that we go into this world not alone. We go into this world to transform it with Jesus Christ. 
It ain't going to happen if we try to do it by ourselves. But when we enter into this world with that ministry and mission in our heart and soul, we can be successful. So Jesus sets us free. He set the disciples free, and we are set free to do the ministry and mission of the church. Maxie Dunham tells a wonderful story about a daughter who leaves home at 18 to go to college, and when she gets to her room, she opens her suitcase up, and she begins taking out her clothes. And over in the corner of the suitcase, she sees this little folded uh, piece of cloth, and she pulls it out, and it's two strings. And then she recon- and she doesn't know what they are until she recognizes the pattern on the strings. And it was her mother's apron strings. Her mother had cut the apron strings and sent them off, her off to college. And that's what parenthood does, doesn't it? Parents don't, we don't create children to be mini-me's. You know, just like us with our same wants and wishes and hopes and dreams. We don't need a mini-me. God already has one of us. We don't, God doesn't need two of us. Two is a waste. God wants us to train up the children into free-thinking, independent adults who understand the character, code, and conduct of a disciple of Jesus Christ and then drop-kick them into the world. You know, don't put a camper in the backyard for them to live in. You drop-kick them into the world to serve the holy. But it's easy to forget that. We, uh, churches all over the United States have forgotten the primary mission of church. Many times we think church is for us. What I like, what I don't like, what I want, what I don't want, my taste, you're not your taste. But you know what? It ain't about you. It's not about you. And guess what? It's not about me either. It's about making disciples for Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. There's a story about a church in Atlanta. I don't know this to be true, and next time I'm down there, I'm going to look it up in the yellow pages just to see myself. But I'm told there's a church down there by the name of Church of God Grill. The Church of God Grill. And I'm told a fella called the Church of God Grill, and he was so intrigued by it that he asked him, how in the world did you come up with that name? And the guy said, well, it's easy. We were a little church. We were suffering. Our budget was low, and we were suffering for money, so we started selling chicken on Sundays. And the chicken sales kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and there was more people coming to Sunday dinner than to Sunday worship, so we decided to shut the church down and sell chicken. You see, the easiest thing in the world to do is to lose sight of the primary mission. To lose sight of the primary purpose. That church was never called to cook chicken. But that's where it ended up, as a restaurant. One of my favorite singers is Pavarotti. And in a TV interview some years ago, he revealed that his father is also a singer. And he shared his talents in all the opera houses in Italy, never the big opera houses, mostly the middle to low-end opera houses. And um, then Pavarotti said with a smile that at times he thought his father's voice was even richer and deeper than his own. And, uh, And while his father was content to sing in the opera houses of Italy, he always had a yen to share his songs with the whole world. Later, uh, the interviewer asked, what is the difference between a good singer and a great singer? And Pavarotti answered, a great singer has fire in his belly. A great singer has fire in the belly. Local churches with fire in their bellies are missional churches. They're churches with a purpose. They're they're churches with clear intent. They're not concerned about who is in control 
or who has the power because the one in control and the one that has the power ought to be Jesus Christ. They're not concerned about polishing glory apples. They are concerned about lifting up the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now the question then is this. Do we have that fire in our belly? Now I'm not just talking about First Church, Myrtle Beach. I'm talking about Christianity, Western Church. Do we have that kind of fire in our, in our belly? I know we all want salvation. But do we really want discipleship? You see, discipleship lays claim on us and expects something out of us. Do we want discipleship as well? Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Let us pray. Help us, O Lord, to not only be seekers of salvation, but pursuers of a disciple's life. Send us out of this place to be missionaries in our homes, at our jobs, at our workplaces, at our places of play. May the way we conduct ourselves and the way we live out our lives draw people to your kingdom. For we ask it in the name of your Son and for his sake. Amen.